Hey guys, this is a video for Hector. So thanks Hector for um, this question or request. So um, for week nine of 2020 in my annual 2020 challenge to bring you guys something cool every week um, in terms of a different variation on what might be quite a common tune, um, we talked about the Mason's apron and that was a request from Jonathan Efting. So thanks Jonathan for that request. Um, and one thing that H Hector asked was potentially for uh, a bit of a tutorial on um, two elements of taking the mason's apron and adapting that from the fiddle because it's typically a fiddle um, virtuoso or like a show-off tune for the fiddle um, and bringing that to the flute and what kind of adaptations you would make um, to make that kind of work for the flute. So specifically Hector I believe you asked for um, thinking about how to do the ornamentation properly and what thought process goes into the ornamentation for that and then also specifically um, how to deal with in this version that I did, the six-part Matt Malloy version, had to deal with the two parts, which are part two and part three, which have a lot of uh, interval jumping in them. Um, so I'll make a few comments on that, and then what I would love is if you guys want to, um, if whoever is watching this in cyberspace, or Hector in particular, if you want to make some comments, we can um, kind of carry on the conversation there about um, some specifics about adapting the mason's apron to the flute. So. Um, there are a few things that I wanted to talk about, so I'll just list them up front and then I'll put them in the comment section, what the um, sections are, and then I'll put a timestamp on each one. So um, I would like to talk about the key first, and then we're gonna talk about the tempo. Uh, and then what I'd like to talk about is um, the breathing in particular. <laughs> and then finally, we'll talk about the octaves and then a, a word on rolls and stuff as an ornamentation. So, um, on the fiddle, and you'll have to, if anyone's watching this who plays the fiddle, please comment, but on the fiddle, apparently A is a very uh, nice tune to play in, and in fact, a lot of fiddle-specific tunes, if you hear somebody say, well, that's a fiddle tune, um, frequently that sounds really good in the key of A, and that's largely built on how the fiddle is, is built, so they've got an open A string, so when you play the A string, there's a lot of nice resonance that comes out of that. The flute is a, a wholesale different instrument, so the flute um, is effectively a pipe. <laughs> it's like, well, this is this is a stick of wood, a Bohm-style metal flute is a pipe, and that means there are different notes that actually have a lot of resonance and sound good on the flute as opposed to the fiddle. So those notes actually are D, because you're effectively making a closed uh, loop of air on the pipe, and G, and if there are any physicists out there, let me know why, but G is also a pretty strong note on the flute. A is good for, for tuning, um, but it's just not as punchy uh, of a note. It's fine. But um, what that really means is the Mason's apron is usually played in A, and in order to make it, and in order to make it flute friendly, it's really helpful to bring it down from A to, uh, I think I had it in D, did I? No, in G, to bring it down from A to G. So that's kind of the reason why um, it's useful to do that. Now, of course, you can play. Uh, the Mason's Apron in A on the flute. But the thing you'll run into is, if you don't have any keys, you're going to need to be comfortable with what's called a half hole, or um, cross fingering, which is effectively creating a an A flat or a G sharp by covering half of hole number three. Um, so you go from a G to a G sharp to an A. Um, and it can be a little bit of a challenge to actually um, get that half hole with any kind of speed. So that's kind of point number one. To make the Mason's Apron flute friendly is bring it down from A to G. Okay, the second point is on the tempo. Um, and I know you didn't ask Hector for this to be covered, but it's important to, um, I, I think, in my opinion, it's important to put tempo as the number one style consideration on this tune because... Um, each of the parts highlights a different kind of skill on the instrument, um, which is intentionally quite challenging and is hard for a, a beginner and even or even an intermediate player to play. Um, so what you want to do is um, err on the side of caution in terms of speed, because you're going to always speed it up later, um, because this is a dance tune. Uh, consistency of tempo is most important. Um, I heard once and like to repeat um, whenever I'm actually doing a class anywhere that for this type of music um, the speed you play needs to be within the range of a human heartbeat because you're playing for dancing 
and um, what you're trying to emulate with the pace of the music is the speed of the of the heartbeat really that's what's underneath it that applies to kind of techno and dance music as well but um, that means that you don't necessarily want to go slower than a heart would be going and you also don't want to go so fast that you know it would be a heart rate that would make somebody keel over so better to err on the, the side of slow jam at first so maybe um totally acceptable to make sure that all of the cool bits in each part can be covered at that tempo. Um, totally a matter of style to say how fast you want to go. I think part of the um, lure and or benefit of this tune is you can go really, really fast if you really want to show off the different parts. Um, but <laughs> do so at your own caution. This is probably too fast to... It's kind of hard to play, but it's also hard to listen to. So try and go somewhere in the middle. Okay, um, now let's think about the uh, third piece, and that's specifically where to breathe. So part of the reason I enjoy doing this tune the most is because I actually, um, you know how when you learn something, there's actually a lesson to be learned in unlearning it. So I actually went back and listened to Matt Malloy's Shadow on Stone album, to try and figure out exactly where he's breathing and then I put up on my um, music page which is on Facebook it's Sarah Hale Music you can click on that and I've got a little um, like a picture of where I've mapped out where he puts ornaments Matt Malloy and where he breathes and what I found was quite interesting is that where he's breathing is actually different um, than where I would choose to breathe so I would suggest that's actually a really good homework exercise for yourself uh, for anyone watching especially if you're a flute player is to just go through and listen and see where is this flute player breathing? Because obviously um, air is the fuel of playing this thing. We can't play it without taking a breath. And whereas in classical music, the standard advice is usually to breathe in between phrases um, without cutting out any notes. Almost always in trad, you want to pick notes to completely cut out and replace with a breath, which again, maybe you know, but um, it's a good exercise for everyone to just map out um, some of your favorite players. It could be Pierre, it could be the greats, and figure out where specifically are they breathing. So um, <clears throat> you always want to take a big, big breath at the beginning, and there's something to be said for trying to over time maximize your um, ability to take big breaths and use your whole lung capacity to the extent that you can. Some people argue you can't really increase your lung capacity, but I think you can, but you want to go really slow. You don't want to hurt yourself. So huge breath at the beginning and then map out where in the tune um, is a person whacking out a note to take a breath. Okay, now we come to the octaves. And I think, Hector, your question specifically was, um, is it better to use articulation to separate the notes in the interval jumps in the Mason's Apron part two and three, or is it better to um, just use your breath? Now. You can definitely use um, articulation, but what you need to think about is, and this is a style question in trad music overall, but what you should maybe think about is um, many people advocate, uh, especially on the flute, sometimes on the tin whistle, separating notes with, with what's called a glottal stop, which effectively is separating the stream of air by saying ha. So... <laughs> That's all one stream of air with me effectively saying, ha, 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 okay? You can actually do a harder articulation uh, with a D sound. So this is a bunch of Ds. Or with Ts. That's ta, 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 ta. Another one that you can use, which is not as useful, is to say K. So that's kind of somewhere in between the uh, D sound and the H sound. So if you were to say K, 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 it's, uh, it's kind of hard. So it's, it feels very unnatural. So those are kind of your four options um, for articulating a stream of air for the flute. And um, the fifth option, which is frequently used in trad, is actually not to articulate whatsoever. So it's just to use your fingers. Um, for all articulation. And a lot of that style comes from, um, 
you know, piping. So basically with alum piping, you just got one stream of air and the only way you can really stop it is by using the um, the popping pad on the, um, you see the little, you know, well, I think you play the pipe so you know all about it, but for everyone else, alum pipers have a strap of leather on their leg used to, um, you know, or the leg in general used to stop the flow of air. So I'm not a piper, so you guys can correct me. Um, long story short, for these two parts, for part two and part three of the Mason's Apron, um, let's get into that. So they go like this. And then Matt Malloy puts in a custom third part, which has a similar principle. So it goes, oops, here it is. up on that is I would use um, a straight stream of air so I actually would not articulate that at all so if we think of the octaves uh, in the second part it's good to just practice that piece over and over again so the first octave is and then the next one is I believe a perfect fifth so it's And I would just practice those jumps until your brain is so bored of it you can't stand it because that'll kind of lock it into your memory to the point where you don't have to focus on it anymore. So maybe if you live with somebody, make sure they're out of the house so you don't annoy them and then just play over and over and over again. You get the idea. And the way that I'm doing that um, is a lot about the flute is difficult to explain. It's also difficult to show because it's all happening inside of your face. Um, but I'm essentially curving my tongue up a little bit like this to go up to the next octave, which pushes air a bit further forward. Another good tip is a lot of people say that you want to blow harder when you're playing to get up to the second octave. But in fact, it's almost always better to think about it as blowing faster. So you want a faster stream of air, not necessarily a harder stream of air. And that's because that when you tend to blow harder, there's a very, very high chance um, that you will make the note go sharp because you put in too much air. Whereas if you just think about blowing faster, um, that tends to lift it up to the next octave. So that's all one stream of air. And I would suggest, if you want to try it like that, don't articulate it all. Um, of course, when we get into matters of style, um, it's up to you. You can honestly do whatever you feel like um, and call it a stylistic choice. <laughs> now, some people might contest that um, and say it is or it isn't traditional or whatever, but it's your choice. Um, if you were to articulate with a glottal stop, it would sound like this. with the D sound would sound like this. And with the T sound would sound like this. And all that's up to you. Okay, the final thing I would suggest, um, and again, all this assumes that we've already got all the notes down. So this is sort of like what to do uh, after you're comfortable with all the notes for all these six parts from Matt Malloy, um, for the Mason's Apron, for the flute is this is actually a really really great tune to just stick a bunch of rolls in now um we can do a tutorial on rolls for anyone who is maybe just approaching them now on the flute um a little bit later but the hack here i suppose is anywhere where in traditional music you've got three of the same note you can effectively put a roll in if you want to so there are numerous numerous occasions to stick in rolls throughout this whole tune um, if we look at the first part, um, a plain version goes like this. So there's at least a couple places to put in a G roll there in the first part. There is way 
way too much to be said about ornamentation to cover m much more in this, but I would suggest that this is a really useful place to put in a, a bunch of rolls. So, especially because in this tune, the end of each part is the same almost every time, you can really vary up what you do with the with that ending, which is always... If you wanted to have a tangible place to start, I would suggest take those last two measures, which show up at the end of almost all of those six parts, and then just think of this kind of a fun exercise as well. Think of as many possible variations as you can that would be cool or weird. And you could honestly, I don't know if, if anyone else does this, probably not because I'm a big nerd, but you could just sit down and quiz yourself and think, how many ways could I possibly vary this that makes any sense at all? You know, and just really let yourself go. I bet you could think of a hundred different ways to vary it, or even a couple hundred different ways. Well, maybe not, but a lot of ways to vary just those two bits at the end. Um, and as an adult learner, that's kind of helpful. The thing about being an adult learner <clears throat> is that oftentimes your thinking brain, your mental chatter brain, can get really bored, you know, because uh, a lot of learning the flute or any instrument is about... Um, it's like a whole body experience. So sometimes you just have to play something over and over again. The learning is in the physical doing. Um, sometimes the learning is in learning how to listen um, more attentively. Um, not so much for trad, but for classical, there can be a whole way of learning through your eyes. Um, and that means that your kind of read-write brain, if you're familiar with the, the that NLP term, um, can get quite bored. So thinking of all those different potential variations is a nice way to... Um, help that more, um, you know, developed part of your brain stay interested while you're training your fingers, your breathing, and all the more physical aspects of playing the instrument. So um, let's, call, let's call that attempt number one, Hector, and um, please do come back if there are any other um, questions that come out of that or an area you'd like to narrow in on, because um, one thing that I learned after taking this music teaching course at the Linster School of Music and Drama from 2017 to 2019 is that even in one tune, you could spend an entire year learning different things about music through a single tune. Um, so I just touched on five of them there. Um, I think I covered all five. I did. So essentially it was um, taking the key down from A to G uh, to make this a flute-friendly tune. It was picking a, a tempo that is consistent but within the range of the human heartbeat, so it sounds natural. Um, then the next bit is um, challenge yourself to map out um, where you would breathe and then where, say, Matt Malloy would breathe or something like that and really listen, where is he taking out a note to put a breath in. Four um, would be practicing these uh, kind of interval jumps of a third and a fifth until you're completely bored but your fingers get it. And then fifth would be, this is a great place to chuck in a lot of rolls and then potentially vary um, those last two measures of each part and think of, try and challenge yourself to think of a hundred different ways to vary the end of that part. Um, and that, that's how I would approach it anyway. So very, very much looking forward to hearing, um, how you would approach this, anyone watching, um, or Hector in particular and anything you'd like to hear next. Okay, cool. Have a good week. Bye.